All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, fifth episode of PTMG Podcast. This time we have a first-time returning guest in Ed Robinson. Woo! A milestone right there. <laughs> Just to uh, remind you all that uh, this podcast is brought to you by the movie Office Ninja, which is not yet available, but will be coming out soon, we hope. And also a reminder that there may be adult co adult language in this podcast. No, oh, fuck, I'm leaving. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> Goddamn son of a bitch. It's nice to warn people and then have it happen a half second later. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing is, Ed ruined my gig with my my my, uh, my gag where I actually say one of the bad words from George Carlin's list of impolite words that he's a, he accumulated in his career. There oh, you're right. I'm sorry. We, let's take it back, and we can do it all again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll fix, this, fix this in post, <laughs> right? That, that's how we always say. Um, but today's word is pearl necklace. Nice. <laughs> which I think we all know what that is. Yeah. So I guess there's not much... Um, there's not much description needed, really, or defining, although for the longest time... It's just I a necklace made out of rocks from oysters, right? That's what that is. Well, yeah, yeah I just, that's I just exactly thought the right. top song was just about, you know, uh, kind of like their version of a gold digger or something. <laughs> you know, this, you know that, that song came out before the days of you could just Google things and find things out on uh, Urban Dictionary and freak the hell out. <laughs> that's true. Yep. Um, so, yeah, uh, on that note, let's uh, have an awkward transition to the intros. I kind of already introduced Rick, uh, Ed, but uh, my guests today are Ed and Rick Robinson. Yes, they are brothers. Uh, Ed, why don't you go ahead first and introduce yourself and plug whatever shit you want. Okay, uh, I'm Ed Robinson. Uh, I have been playing fantasy football for way too long, and... Um, I'd love it if you'd watch my shows, Pairings the Series, uh, pairingstheseries.com, and uh, Sci-Fi and Dining, which you can find on youtube.com backslash sci-fi riot. Or just search for Sci-Fi and Dining. And that's about it. All right, Rick, go ahead. Uh, I'm Rick Robinson. Uh, also, check out Pairings, because, you know, I'm involved in that show, too. Um, <laughs> I have a... Uh, we have a movie coming out that I worked on with David Nett and Andrew Deutsch, Frederick Snyder, called Alice and the Monster. If you go to alicethemonster.com, there's not a ton there now, but there will be very soon, and we're close to completion on that film. Uh, Justin Waggle and I have a uh, board game company we're starting up called Grey Wolf Games, so go check us out, greywolfgames.com, with an A in the word gray. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't released anything, but it's on its way. Wait, so what, what are you going to do with that? Are, are you actually making board games? That's the plan. Yeah, well, that's they've the made plan. one, right? Justin, we, do, we went to Gen Con this year, and Justin play-tested his game in the developer's hall, where essentially you show it to gamers, you get feedback, uh, you try to generate some interest. And so we're at Gen Con, and it was a lot of fun, and we got a lot of good feedback on his first game. Um, yeah, I mean, the hope is we get people excited about it, we win a contest or two, we kickstart it, we raise the money to get, you know, the first 2,000 copies made, we get in touch with a distributor that we met at Gen Con, and, you know, hopefully we move on from there. But the plan is to avoid the massive influx of $40,000 worth of capital that's necessary to actually produce a board game. Because <laughs> so. that's tough. That's a tough stuff for my wife. Uh, Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me board games, uh, the business of board games is a lot like the business of movies and comic books? Yeah, it's it's tough. Like, you know, if you're an established designer, people are going to pay you royalties for what you're working on next. But if you're, you know, me, they uh, don't. So the, the good news, though, is with a Kickstarter for a, uh, a board game, you have something to offer them. Like, if you make your goal... Everybody gets your game. It's yeah, you like pre, you're, you're, you're essentially pre-ordering the game. So if you're spending 40 bucks, we either fail and it's no harm, no foul, or you're pre-ordering a game and we give you the game when we make it. So 
as long as people believe in you and believe in your product, it's not like web series where it's pure goodness of your heart. It's also, hey, I get something in return. Um, with web series, it's tough because you're giving that content away for free. You're all you're offering is swag associated with the show, which is good, but it's nice to be able to offer the actual product as an incentive on Kickstarter. Right. Uh, well, you know, the, the other thing you can try to do is like a premiere uh, of a web series. Yeah. That's true. And, and, and fans, I mean, you can get stuff to offer them, but it's not quite the same where they're literally buying your product by donating. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, little known trivia fact, or actually probably a pretty well known trivia fact, the one thing that uh, Alice and the Monster and Pairings have in common would be one of your other guests, Rob Goki, is the composer for both of those. That is true. That's true. And he's uh, he's actively working on Alice and the Monster score right now, or if he's not. <laughs> <laughs> How do you and probably not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> I should make it a running gag, although I've already told Rob I'm going to bring him on, but, like, because we've already talked about Rob twice. Oh, has he not been on? I thought he'd been a guest. No, he he, he um made a cameo on Allison's uh, <laughs> last week, but, like, not I him. haven't brought him on as a guest yet. <laughs> so... It would be an. It would be, he he could be like our Matt, like the Matt Damon to my Jimmy Kimmel. You need to you need to excuse him, like kick him off at the end of every show. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, for, sorry, we didn't have time for Rob Goki today. <laughs> Man, he would get. Yeah, that would be awesome. Although he would not no longer make tacos for me, so that that would be a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so um, let us uh, get to some of our uh, topics today. Um. For those who have uh, never seen this podcast, my goal is to try to talk about things that are nerdy, artsy, especially in movies, and sports-related because, for some reason, I have immense interest in all of those things, and it's a little hard to keep track of everything. Uh, so uh, one of the topics I wanted to bring up was in the, on the recent episode of Tabletop, the, they did Lords of the Water Deep. Um, I've never played that game, although I've been to Rick's a couple of times. I've seen it there. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Uh, Rick, you saw that episode. Uh, did you feel like it was a good representation of how that game is played? I do. I do. I think they overplayed a bit much on how interactive it is, and they talked about forming alliances, and it really is a worker placement game, so... You know, it, it's it's for fun, so I understand why they did it, but they overplayed the kind of uh, people being able to mess with each other aspect. There are very limited ways in that game for people to to actively hose other players more than just placing their worker in the spot that other players need. So, but mostly they, they showed you how the game was played. I, I think it represented the game fairly well. I think a couple of the players were genuinely terrible at it, like... <laughs> I don't know what they were. I think they must have played that game. But like, <laughs> but they're playing like change of plans before they've been given a mandatory quest, and their their top <laughs> scores at the end of the game were were not good. And so, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the show, going like, I could have crushed all these guys. <laughs> Patrick Rothfuss was pretty good. I'd imagine was, Patrick Rothfuss would be good. Uh. And it was interesting to see him. I, I, I've read his book and I love it, but I've never, you know, I've never met him or seen him. So it was I cool to see him playing a game. Yeah, it was cool to see him playing a game and seem like a, a regular funny guy. <laughs> I know my uh, Jody, my wife, loves Lords of the Waterdeep. That's one of her favorite games right now. It's just I, I like it. It's it plays in about an hour and a half, and not like hour and a half like it says on the box, hour and a half, like a legitimate hour and a half or less even if the players all know what they're doing. People can easily pick up and play it. If you play games like Agricola, or even a game like Ticket to Ride, you're going to be relatively familiar with the mechanics. Um, there's enough luck involved that I think new newbies feel like they have a chance in the game, whereas there's enough skill involved that players who are good will win more often than players who aren't. Um, it's a good balance. It's, it's on the casual side. And thematically, it might scare off casual players because you're going on quests like domesticate owlbears and <laughs> hard to pronounce D and D related things. But you know, I enjoy that theme. 
Uh, and I think it's a good game. Like, it's one of the ones that hits my table most often because of the speed of the play, the accessibility, and that it's just, it's fun. It's fun. And even though there's not a whole lot of things you can do to interact, there's still a lot of smack talking. Or I can say shit talking. We could, we're on a, yeah, on a yeah. podcast. Shit, talk, shit talking. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I get the sense, and I have no proof of this, but I always get the sense that the game wasn't designed with D&D, like, owlbearer-type quests in mind. It feels a little like a Gricola-style game, and it was probably designed with that strategy in mind, and then Wizards of the Coast said, could you maybe make this with, you know, thieves and rogues and... Yeah, thieves? either either Watsy took an existing an existing property, an existing d- design, and say, hey, what does this look like if it's in Waterdeep, and we have th- thieves and rogues instead of, you know, pigs and cows or whatever. <laughs> and uh, or Or they just said, hey, listen, we need our designers to go and design a game like these worker placement games like Stone Age or Agricola, we need a game like this in our world. I, I'm, I don't know which it was, but it's obvious they went out to create a game like that, and I think they did a good job with it. Cool. Um, yeah, I didn't... Uh, so, is it... T- I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, D&D, but is it tied to that? Because I, I could have sworn it said like it was from Dungeons & Dragons or something. It is. It's tied to D&D. Basically, Waterdeep is a city in the Forgotten Realms world, which is the, the world of Faerun, and I'm a dork, so welcome to my <laughs> So it takes place in the world of Faerun. Uh, I think it's called the City of Splendors. It's north of Baldur's Gate, so it's, it's an established city in a very, the, the most popular D&D setting. Okay, so those familiar with D&D, like, know that, like, the back of their hand. Well, and a lot of people read R.A. Salvatore. It's in the same world that the Drizzt Warden R.A. Salvatore books take place. Yeah. Most people know it. One of the guys on Tabletop was like, I don't know what an owlbear is. I'm like, you should get kicked off of the show. It's called Tabletop. Well, does Ben, do you know what an owlbear is? I want to know. Okay, the last 45 <laughs> seconds of what both of you guys just said went over my head. Yeah. <laughs> you could have been telling yeah. me cricket uh, terminology, and I'd have no bloody clue what you guys you're talking about. So, uh, so yeah, this obviously is, again, my nerd cred has gone down 150 points. Just, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that stuff. Like, I did not no. know what an owlbear is until I saw the episode. I, I, think, yeah. I think it needs to be clear, though, that uh, you don't need to be into that stuff to play it. Jody does not like D&D. She doesn't play D&D. She's not into any of that stuff. And all the tokens are like white cubes and red cubes and black cubes. It's just a flavor. So if you, the game can be enjoyed by people who don't like that kind of. And I, I agree with that. You don't have to be deeply into the theme to to like the game. But I just recently also got the expansions to Lords of Waterdeep. They released two expansions in one box called. Oh, interesting. Something. What's it called? Scoundrels. <laughs> Scoundrels of Skullports. Say it's right here. Scoundrels of Skullport. And it's good too. One of the expansions is better than the other one, but good. see, I have a lot of games here. I have my full geek cred going. Yeah, we we oh, you got clue. We neglected yeah. to mention, yeah, the <laughs> Rick's wallpaper literally behind yeah. him. <laughs> audio podcast audio podcast listeners will not be able to see, but uh, believe you me, I've been to uh, his man cave, um, and yeah, it's yes. quite yeah, yes. well. Uh, it I've is. got like two shells down there. That's that's all I have. <laughs> I recently have upped my. I had uh, tripled my gaming collection by buying Pandemic and uh, Forbidden Island. So I'm up oh, to nice. three. Is it the new edition of Pandemic, the most recent version? Um, it's the uh, it's one of the newer versions where it has uh, there's up to seven possible uh, characters you can. Oh, use. cool! No, yeah, I saw that. Um, you, you know, the expansion lets you play up to five, which I've never seen before. But, yeah, this one has, like, uh, they, they, they redefined or helped clear up some of the questions and, and the confusions in, uh, for some of the actions. And, but even that, it was, you know, uh, first time trying to play it with my mom, uh, it, it, was, it still took a while for me to get a grip on uh, what exactly is going on other than disease is just running rampant all over the place. Pandemic's depressing to me, because it's like, I've never <laughs> won the pe- pandemic, which is weird. 
And it's just, everyone, it's the entire world dies if you don't win that game. <laughs> and it's, it's a hard game, too. Like, if it would be, when you're first starting to play Pandemic, it'll eat you up if you don't have a team that knows what they're doing. So. Although, it, it's total hypocrisy on my part, because I love Arkham Horror, and literally, if you lose that game, the world is eaten by a monster, like some right. giant monster. And that doesn't bother me at all. Right, well, apparently you just prefer monsters that you can see. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, um, you love, apparently you love Cthulhu and not viruses, which is <laughs> weird, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, there's clearly a lot of games I still need to play that I'm slowly getting uh, familiar with and whatnot. <laughs> um, but going, uh, one last thing quick about Lords of the Waterdeep, does it enhance the experience if you're familiar with D&D? Yeah, because, I mean, enhance, yes, because all the quests are related to that world and there are people and places that are who are familiar with that universe. They'll be familiar with a lot of the cards in the game, a lot of the characters you get to play, so it enhances it, but it doesn't make you a better player. Like, you could, if you're really good at Agricola, that you're going to be better off. You'll crush people at Lords of Waterdeep even if you've never seen or heard of D&D. Right. So, you know, it enhances it from a, from a theme perspective, but not a gameplay perspective. So it kind of allows you to, like, kind of play through a story or certain characters in a different yeah. manner, basically. Yeah, I mean, you can take the game back all the way to the base level of ab abstraction where it's just green cubes and I'm the green player. But knowing the world, I'm playing as the Harpers, and and my lord is, you know, somebody who I'm familiar with, and I'm going on quests, a part of the city, that I've been on an adventure in D&D, you know, I've been on a published adventure that matches the quest type that I'm playing in Lord's Waterdeep. So it enhances it from a thematic perspective, uh, I would say. Sounds good. Well, uh, then in that case, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to play it sometime. Uh, apparently, You don't get to come over here and just crush me at my own game, though, the first time I play it. <laughs> That's that's yeah. never gonna happen again. Yeah. Never gonna happen again. <laughs> that was we funny. played we played Seven Wonders and we're like, Ben, we'll show you how to play this game. He's like, oh, what does this do? And what does that do? And he just crushed us. He just yeah, I yeah. Somehow I won purely with military and uh, something else, but like no science cards whatsoever. No, no <laughs> science. Only strength. Only power. Yeah, it was purely, like just pure brute force. Like dumb. it wasn't close either. I remember that game was just a disaster for everyone. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember how, but I've never won since then. Basically, I played with my uh, my my family, uh, and usually I do not win. Interesting. But uh, we just we just super suck then. I guess. <laughs> I guess. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well. Um, not exactly a smooth transition, but uh, we're going to jump to a... Com and now for something completely different. Hey, it's a game. We're still talking about a game. No, let's, <laughs> let's do it this way. The right transition is, speaking of super suck, let's talk about Oakland Raiders football. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well played. Mike, you can deny it. Well played, sir. All right, well... I had to wear my depressing shirt. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, for those who uh, are not familiar with sports ball that is go about to happen, I'm going to be uh, unproductive for the next 20 Sundays, basically because of the upcoming NFL season, which starts this Thursday. <clears throat> and so uh, Rick and Ed, are, like me, are big sports fans of the NFL. Uh, just a heads up. Uh, I refuse to call it football anymore because I'm now a soccer snob, so I don't call it the NFL. You guys can say football as is. I'm I'm not going to judge. I'm just being a asshole about it. You do realize NFL has football in it. That's what the I asking. know. Well, but now it's just three letters. Oh, I see. So the the and, and here's the thing. Like it should be called American style rugby because. If you watch rugby, it's way more similar to what the NFL is than what soccer is. And know, I'm, I'm not going to deny that, but I still think calling it the NFL is like Kentucky Fried Chicken renaming this or it's KFC. I mean, but I, I'm confused. As as Americans, we get to call things what we want to call them, right? I mean, football, <laughs> right? Don't, don't we just get to dictate that we have football now and that's what we call it? I'm confused. <laughs> 
I, I mean, I, I, I've become more of a man of the world, I guess. Or, oh, I see. Man of the world. I've been enlightened by the English Premier League about you know this this beautiful sport that is called football that should be yeah. rightfully called the rest of the world calls football and we should follow suit just like how we should be following the metric system instead of staying imperial. I'll agree with you. But we need the a system. shorter word for football than American football, though. Like something shorter or American style advanced rules rugby doesn't work either. So well, well that's that's a thing. Really? Have, you, have you heard of Aussie rules football? That's like a whole form of of rugby that's. Totally different from both football or rugby. Is that right? When is yeah, it? it's, it's it's a weird game where there's like three. Uh, I think there's three. Uh, you know, like uh, what do you call the pillars? Kickers kick the pylons. Three pylons, and you can run with the ball and kick it through the pylons. It makes no sense when I watched it in Australia. Do they play three four defenses or four three? No, it's defenses? much more like rugby where people are tackling each other, grabbing the ball. I don't want it. I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, after that clarification, <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to go division by division, and we'll just start off again. Rick, Rick is absolutely right. We should just start off with the most depressing uh, team, which is my beloved Raiders uh, in the A- AFC West. <clears throat> um, Who's the quarterback for that team, by the way? It's Terrell Pryor. I'll answer that trivia question. It's Terrell Pryor. <laughs> Right it's not Matt Flynn, who I feel like we should invite on this podcast and pay him a million dollars to come on and then just replace him with somebody else. <laughs> I would totally replace him with Chris Cluey just because he's... Oh, I love Chris Cluey. And he's a Raider now, so... Yeah. I, I, it's sad to see Shane Leckler leave because he was one of the greatest punters of our generation, of many, many generations, although his uh, kicking numbers have kind of fallen down lately. Uh, and to replace him with um, with, with a Warcraft nut, you know, like uh, like Chris is is pretty awesome. So Chris Cluey knows what an owlbear is. Yes, he would. <laughs> he's, he's he's for gay rights, so he's he's my favorite punter. He yeah, he, he's definitely high up there in my favorite. Like he's actually the only NFL player that I actually follow on Twitter. He yeah. Was, he he got to um he he got uh to uh get uh Google glasses, and so he spent like a whole week doing practice with the Google glasses on. So uh you were able, and granted you know punting is not the most exciting thing to see, <laughs> <laughs> but you get to see you know the ball fly towards your face and then you know kick him you know see the kick. Yeah. Uh, he he put it on Janikowski the kicker. Uh, just to kind of see what it's like to, to, to kick a field goal. I love Seabass. <laughs> that C-Bass guy is amazing. And the, Seabass is the only guy that if, if somebody's actually broken the rest of the team's tackles when they're running back a uh, kickoff, he might actually tackle the guy. Like, every other kicker folds. Like, <laughs> they just kind of fold in on themselves and melt. Like, I don't want that person to touch me. Seabass, like, want, he looks forward to that. His eyes get fiery and he, like, he, he gets murderous. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of a psycho, frankly. Which yeah, that's, that's the, the downside. Those, um, yeah, I, I've seen him dive for, you know, as the last, uh, you know, the last man standing on a kickoff return and just dive, like, co- comedically bad just because he is fairly large and tubby. Uh, but, yeah, he, he's a great kicker. But, again, when your kicker and for a while your punter was the best thing going for you. It, it's been pretty rough. Um, I mean, for me, it, it's at least they're cleaning house now, even though I hated to see Matt Shaughnessy and um, Desmond Bryant go. I thought they were young enough that they could be part of a rebuilding project uh, for the defensive line. <clears throat> and, and they're pretty cheap, I believe. I, I, I don't really follow their contracts because that could get confusing, but so the fact is they have almost half of their salary for this upcoming season in dead money. That's all the players. Yeah, forty million in guys who aren't for guys who aren't playing this year. Right. So, That's so are they still paying for Carson Palmer right now, or is it just all the draft picks that they have to? Um, I think, I think it's the, like the Darius Hayward Bays, the Rolando McLeans. Uh, I so think Arizona has picked up all of of Carson Palmer's salary. 
I don't quite know how exactly that works. I'm guessing a portion of it probably was still paid by the Raiders, probably for this upcoming season. I like guess uh, that's it could get very, very confusing trying to get the numbers right. But uh, I, I, I deeply enjoy making fun of the Raiders, but I have to admire what Reggie McKenzie's doing, which is I don't want to go six and ten this year. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. He's just deciding, I don't want to go 6-10, and 10, so let's see what we have in Terrell Pryor. Let's throw together a team. We're finally purging all this bad money. Let's just suck, you know, to the degree that we have a chance at Clowney out of college this year, Bridgewater, whoever, whoever's going to help the team most. In a way, I admire the, you know what, let's just, we're going to rebuild proper and not, throw together a team that's going to be depressingly mediocre. The Raiders will suck really well this year. <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to half suck. I feel bad for Dennis Allen because the end of the, at the end of this year he's 2 and 14. Does he weather this rebuilding? I just don't know. Well, the from what I'm getting and this is partly cuz what I've read from the Football Outsiders and they kind of have some information but not really it's basically it has to start with the new ownership, which is Al, the late great Al Davis's son, Mark, whether he has the right head on his shoulders. And it sounds like he does because he hired, you know, he's willing to let Reggie McKenzie build everything from the ground up and understand there's a plan. Like, yeah. Yeah, I also don't mind that this year the Raiders will suck. Um, there, <clears throat> It looks like there is a plan. Now, the one thing that gave me pause is when out of nowhere, they they fired their uh, PR guy who was chosen by McKenzie. <clears throat> yeah, and it was Davis who did that, and he did it he did it aggressively and out of the blue. Yeah, it felt very Al Davis like, which again, yeah. you know, you, you hope it's maybe it's some isolated incident and not the harbinger of you know more Davisness. Well, in was, general. I mean, I actually like the Raiders, and I think the NFL is better when the Raiders are good. So I'd like them to get better sooner rather than later. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the Carson Palmer trade has, has crippled you for a while, but it was, it was, it yeah, was I agree. That, it happened. It's terrible now. Everybody knows that was terrible. It was just bad. <laughs> I was so angry, like, with the minute I saw that trade happen because it was so short-sighted. There was yep. the the Raiders. I really was pulling for Jason Campbell just because, you know, for those not familiar with his story, he keeps getting bounced not just from team to team, but also every year he's had a he somehow ends up with a new coach or a new offensive uh, coordinator. So he's always had to learn something new. Like he could be a heck of an offensive coordinator when he retires. <laughs> but and him and Alex Smith both came to the league, and they're like, every year you're going to have a new offensive coordinator. Yeah, At least Alex Smith team. was on one team, though. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. We'll, we'll get to Alex Smith later. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jason Campbell actually had uh, his best, um, his most efficient game, uh, his most efficient season last season or two seasons ago before the injury happened, and then that's when they panic trade for Carson Palmer. It wasn't like they had a shot at making the championships. That's the thing. Is that they... They weren't. A, it was a short-sighted trade by Hugh Jackson. He should not have had that much power. He's a coach. He wants to save his job, so he's fine with going nine and seven, making the playoffs, and keeping his job. Someone with more foresight should have said, "No, we're not mortgaging to you know a first-round draft pick in a second, you know, for a guy who's going to get us over the hump to ten and six in a first-round playoff exit." No, it's, it was done. It, it, but, um, emotions had to be running high at that point. I mean, Al Davis just oh, yeah. died. That has to be affecting the decision making of his son. Like, I don't think we can, we can judge what he's gonna do later by that one decision. That could be a fluke. Yeah, I'm, that, that's what I'm hoping. I mean, right now. There, there, go ahead. There was a troubling article, and I think it was a Mercury News. I think it was Tim Kawakami, but I might be wrong. Who said something though? It was he was taking Red, Reggie McKenzie to task and saying that a lot of the GMs around the league were losing respect for him. And basically it was the first article I had read that shed a negative light on the way Reggie McKenzie was handling the rebuilding process. I don't agree with it, but it was interesting to read an article where the first one of its type, which was saying this ex-Packers guy was actually had losing credibility in the league. And I'm curious, you know, it's hard to go through a 2-14 and 14 year and maintain all of your respect around the league. 
I tend to think he's doing the right thing, but hopefully he's doing it the right way, shedding the right things and making the right draft picks. Because it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to suck hard, and then we're going to draft. But then if you draft poorly, you're going to continue to suck hard. Right, I mean... Hopefully DJ Hayden was a smart pick. It showed some some judgment to trade back to get him, because clearly he was their guy. Clearly. Yeah, and that yet, was amazing. That they were able to get that, alignment out of that trade. Yeah. Basically. Um, yeah. Uh, do you remember uh, about that article? Like, was it more specific about how he's losing credibility? Because I've never heard. I don't listen to too much off-season gossip about that stuff. Yeah. But uh, do you remember anything about that article? It was just. It was kind of just quoting like shadowy off. You know, GMs basically saying. He had the power to make a deal, and then he didn't, and, you know, he was wishy-washy on when he wanted to do something. He backed out of trades in the draft last minute. So it was more an article where unnamed GMs were poking holes in the Reggie McKenzie is doing a good job story that seems to be the most prevalent. And hopefully that's just sour grapes. Like, that could easily just be the one guy who was negotiating a trade with him that he backed out on. Yeah, and, and Kawakami's no fan of the Raiders. Like, he's got a history of kind of just bagging the organization, so... It's really weird. It's just, for some reason, I mean, I, there's, to me, there's no rivalry between the 49ers and the Oakland Raiders, but most of my Niner fan friends hate the Oakland Raiders, and I, I don't know that I completely understand it. In my view, they're the other Bay Area team now. The trouble is is that, I, you know, we grew up in San Jose, and if San, if we're growing up in San Jose, you chose your football team. That's you true. chose the Niners and the Raiders because you're equidistant. And so it well, kind of like, at that point, the Raiders were in L.A. Like when I was growing up. Well, the Raiders, that was when you, that's when you were hitting your football fandom. But I, yeah. I started liking football. It was like the end, right. certainly Tom Flores. But I think it was the end of John Madden, like 1980, I was aware of football. So they were Oakland. When did they go from... Oakland to L.A., was that 84, 83? I'm going to say, like, even as early as 82? I, 82. Okay, like, 82. I should know I was very early. I was, I was nine then. Did, were you an, a Raiders fan because they were in L.A., or are you a Bay Area guy then? No, I, yeah, it was. they were already in L.A. Uh, I had just moved back uh, to uh, Southern California in around 90, 80, oh, okay. 89, 90, and that's when Bo Jackson was oh, a uh, superhero <laughs> Uh, greatest and he's so, ridiculous. He was ridiculous. I watched Bo Jackson play on TV. He was ridiculous. So that, I, I'm sad I that his that, was yeah, I, I latched onto that team like crazy, and then I still remember seeing uh, that playoff game against the Bengals where he broke his hip, and I for the longest time like uh, I was watching the Bo Jackson um, documentary. I didn't realize it happened on the day of my birthday. Oh man! Yeah. So that's probably why I repressed that memory so bad, <laughs> and why I. And that's why every every year you hate your birthday too. You're like, oh, something bad's gonna happen. <laughs> I'm in the multiverse where the hip got broken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I do have to admit, though, that makes more sense now that I'm kind of aware of the history because with like baseball, I did pick my team, so I feel much more loyal to the A's, and I always will, and I'm not really a big Giants fan. Cause you're, yeah, you're equidistant to the two. I, I think, like, yeah, as a kid, you're going to naturally want to pick sides because when I, at that time, the Rams were also in Los Angeles, and again, yeah. you know, my classmates were choosing sides, Raiders or, or Rams, and you see this in all the, I, I think you have to pick one in one division uh, or only one uh, in your city, whether, granted, baseball's yeah. kind of funky with, like, different leagues, but uh, in general, like, I can't, like, I can't see myself as a Clipper fan and a Laker fan at the same time. Same reason why when both uh, Rams and Raiders were in L.A., I could only choose one. Uh, and thankfully, I chose the right one. Well, <laughs> did you? Not, did you not really? the last 10 years. Someday. <laughs> someday, Ben. It'll be the right one again. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll see about that. Teddy Bridgewater will lead the 2019 Raiders to championship glory. <laughs> uh, we'll see if I'm if we're in that multiverse. Uh, <laughs> so the the other thing that's very depressing about these uh, you know this this season will be uh, one of my one of the Raiders arch rivals is the Denver Broncos, and it's probably fair to say that they're one of the favorites to be the Super Bowl winner of this year. I'm calling they lose in the championship right now. 
Oh, really? Well, I I would I'm not as I'm not as bullish on the Broncos this year. I don't like the losing Von Miller for an extended period of time. Peyton Manning has to be a human being at some point. Um, Wes Welker, I like him, but you know the Patriots usually give up on players right about the right right time. Uh, I like their young receivers. Running back, can he block for Peyton Manning? Can that defense survive without their heart and soul for those six games? Like sometimes momentum matters. And if they start their season three and three, they're not going to be this juggernaut entering the playoffs as they normally would. So I like the Broncos. They're certainly better than the Chiefs. They're better than the Raiders. What's the fourth team in that division? Oh, they're better than the Chargers. So, yeah, they're going to division. And the, the running back is – the running back point, though, is one of the best points I think Rick made, that Monty Ball right now looks like he's the future of that, thi- of that, of that team, but he can't he's, – right now he's having trouble blocking. So – they're they're gonna have a problem where they want Ronnie Hillman in there to block, but they want Monty Bill. What? Ronnie Hillman fumbles, and so yeah. now you have no Sean Morena, who's not sexy, but at least he can block, keep Kate play Payne Manning clean. But yeah, he's not much of a weapon. It's interesting. I, I'm not as I like the Broncos. Obviously, I think they might win that division, or they'll probably win that division. But I don't think they're gonna they're gonna move into the Super Bowl this year. I don't think so either. I think they will lose. In the playoffs, I, I do think there's a good chance to make the championship game. Yeah, I'm very uh, subjective. Obviously, I wish them to damnation. You hate, you hate the Broncos. Yeah. Hate the Broncos. <laughs> well, the thing is, I equally hate the Chiefs and the Broncos. For some reason, I could care less about the Chargers. Part of it was Ladine and Tomlinson was like badass at that time, so like I gave him props. And like Chargers never really seem to have a rivalry with the uh, Raiders. They're not an easy team to hate. Like, what have they really done to deserve hate? Like, I don't love them, but there's nothing to hate. I don't know, but apparently we throw, you know, snowballs with batteries in them at Denver Broncos <laughs> players and Chiefs players. So, you know, go classy Raider uh, fans, you know, that that's how we roll. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that you mentioned that Monty Ball can't uh, block, so it reminded me of a joke of, so now he's going to be called God Damn It Monty because um, I don't know if you remember um, when Peyton Manning was on the the Colts, uh, Donald Brown was mm. the running back, and it was clear as day. It's supposed to be huge. It was it was a hilarious joke, but so Donald Brown was supposed to block, and he completely pass blocked the incorrect way or was not looking, and he was supposed to be the safety valve for Peyton Manning, and you can clearly hear it during the broadcast. He yells, God damn it, Donald! And he has to throw the ball away. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, when, when, um, the, uh, I'm a, obviously I'm a big part of the Football Outsiders community. Uh, they latched onto that like crazy, and so every time they mention Donald Brown, they have to call him God damn it, Donald Brown. That's awesome. <laughs> so, if Monty Ball is going to be doing the same thing, then we're going to have a God damn it, Monty. <laughs> Well, my guess I, is that Peyton won't let him be the running back until he does fix it, and I hear he's getting better. I, I enjoy all the comments out of Broncos camp and out of Colts camp where they talk about the difference between Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning because they always ask him, like, is Peyton Manning an asshole or whatever the right way to say that is. Is he an asshole? And they always go, well, he's – let's call him a perfectionist. Or, like, you know, basically every which way you can say, yeah, he's a total – <laughs> He's a total demanding asshole as a quarterback, not as a human being, but as a quarterback. He will just rip your ass if you're wrong. And I always enjoy the way they kind of dance around saying it. And all the Colts guys are like, yeah, Andrew Luck, like, he, he like, likes to have fun, and he, like, high-fives you occasionally when you do the right thing. And... <laughs> well, it's sometimes good for, you know, the a change of culture, I guess, regardless of where you're at. That's the thing. And, and – I, I actually I like Pay I like Pay Man. I, I enjoy watching him, but he's like a coach. And he sometimes he acts like a coach when he's chewing out the players on this team and uh, I guess you just have to learn to live with that as his teammate. Yeah, I mean for me, uh, obviously, you know, we won't go too much into Brady versus Manning, but I do and I I hope Manning does get to play for as long as he can, just because I really do enjoy watching him, you know, orchestrate an offense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it really is a, a sight to see just, you know, as I'm learning more and more about uh, the sport and how to, like, you know, how, how you coordinate blocking schemes and hot routes and, and all these other, like, crazy terminologies. 
And ultimately, I think that's what it comes down to, is you can deal with Brady, with, with Manning yelling at you occasionally as long as you're winning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, what, like, Manning has never lost, has always won 10 games every year or something like that? I know, like, quarterback wins are sometimes a little bit overrated, but that, that's still pretty darn impressive, I think. No, it's, it's hugely yeah. impressive. He, if he, he's in the conversation to be one of the top five quarterbacks of all time. I don't quite put him there because he until he wins another Super Bowl. But you don't put him in the top five of all time, Peyton? Of all time? I, I don't know. We, without another Super Bowl ring, it's hard. I mean... That's tough. I, well, I'm trying to think. Like, I don't, top five, the top five is tough to get into. So you're so. saying Dan Marino would not be in your top five because he's never won a Super Bowl. I, I mean, I think I think most people t- put Dan Marino in their top five. I think that, though, that him and Peyton Manning are the exception to the rule. The uh, question was, do you put Dan Marino in your top five? Is Dan Marino uh, there? Hell. Does he suit up? If he's in my top five, he's at five. Oh, but he probably, man, wow. just on the edge. Uh, <laughs> But 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 the, here's the thing. Like, who's uh, you didn't want to get into the Brady Manning thing, but I mean, if you're going by who who's the best. If I had to put one of them in the top five right now, even though I normally think just from pure talent, Manning's the better quarterback, Brady's what he's he's done it better. He's won more Super Bowls. He's kept that team on top. It's hard to argue. It's hard to argue Brady over Manning. I mean, I mean to me, Brady has a better resume for the top quarterback than Manning does. So if I'm gonna pick one current era quarterback to throw in the top five, I think it's gotta be Brady right now. We'll have to see how history plays out, but that's why I don't know that I put him in the top five. It's I mean, tough to compare modern era quarterbacks to, to Joe Montana and those quarterbacks because Joe Montana threw for like 3,600 yards and completed like 60% of his passes. I mean, nowadays that that would look like the 15th best in the league, both from a, a rate standpoint, a volume standpoint, a yards per attempt standpoint. It's just tough because... Stats don't tell the whole story comparing era to era. Obviously, I'm going to put Montana in my top five because I'm a homer. I'm going to put him in my top one. I'm a homer. <laughs> but, well, uh, Montana and Johnny U. I think most people put those as the top two. Johnny United, for those who don't know who Johnny U is. Right. Yeah. Another guy to compare to modern era quarter. It's hard to even compare him to Joe Montana because they're just playing different, different styles of the game. Yeah, I, that's yeah. We'll we'll have to table the best quarterbacks discussion well, because we're on our second team West, reunion. Now, to, team team two. We're on team two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're literally in the NFC West still, so we, we need to get out of it. But before we do, we have to talk about Alex Smith since we've been talking about quarterbacks. All right. Well, how do you guys feel about Alex Smith at the Chiefs? I, there's been some buzz that the Chiefs are going to make the playoffs. There's going to bounce back. Um, you know, there's some like Football Outsiders does agree. There's some bounce back for sure with some uh, because. They were com- very, very. Um, you know, you're getting a much better uh, quarterback, a much better coach, and the injuries uh, will go back to league average, in theory. Rick likes Alex Smith, so I'll let him answer first. I I like Alex Smith as a person. I enjoyed watching his career. I enjoyed watching him handle adversity. I enjoyed watching him improve. So I'm a big fan of Alex Smith as a as a person and as a quarterback and as a guy who handles adversity, all of that being said, his upside is average NFL quarterback. That's tough to say as a guy who likes him, but everybody who wants to point to his early season stats last year, I say that's a small sample size. And he didn't face some of the tougher defenses Kaepernick did, and he did play a lot of conservative football. Uh, I just feel like, if the Chiefs have great, if they're great everywhere else, championship caliber great, yes. Alex Smith is capable of Trent Dilfering a team to a Super Bowl. I don't think that's who the Chiefs are, so I don't like them to win that division. I like them to improve. Andy Reid, I think, is a good coach. My Eagles friends would disagree with me, but I feel like Andy Reid's a good coach. Alex Smith is a decent, you know, I don't like to use the word game manager quarterback, so I don't really understand what that means, but he's an average quarterback. Uh, Jamal Charles, a good talent. Their defense is young, so yeah, eight and eight, nine yeah. and seven, maybe. Their defense is can be very, very scary. I mean, uh, so those who don't know, I, I do this game charting project with the Football Outsiders, where I have to rewatch games and uh, break down play by play about uh, uh, 
extra stats that happen that I send back to Football Outsiders. And, of course, yeah. I'm the only Raiders fan out there, so I get to watch all the Raiders sucking. But it means I get to see the Chiefs twice. And Tom Bahali is – obviously, everyone loves J.J. Watt. J.J. Watt is – an incredibly entertaining defensive player to watch, especially yeah, he's great. Year, but, I have him on one of my fantasy teams. Year in, year out, Tom Bahali, like he works his ass off. He like destroys uh, offensive tackles left and right. You know, he's almost like the complete package. Like he's all he's kind of like you know uh, Michael Myers. He's always he's never stopping. He's going to come for you. Yeah, <laughs> as a quarterback. Um, yeah, obviously their defense is not where the you know that two thousands Raiders uh, Ravens team is going to be yet. Uh, but yeah, you know you'd like I, to. See I, I like their defense. I like where the Chiefs are going. I don't think Alex Smith is the answer because what we're going to see this year is we're going to see Alex Smith. Everybody remembers this really brief period of time where Alex Smith, the last like year and a half, when he had Harbaugh as a coach, stopped throwing interceptions and started you know just making the right decision. But you forget the, like, five or six years before that where he was the interception king and made all the wrong decisions. He's going to go back to that without great coaching. And Andy Reid, while he's a good coach, I think, isn't the coach that stops interceptions. I mean, it's not like he's, he, he has a great resume of quarterbacks who are really tight about where they throw the football. Well... Here's the last thing I'll say about um, Alex Smith. I don't remember where the news article came from, uh, but it was really interesting to see how they broke down what Alec, why Alex Smith was succeeding so well with Harbaugh. Is the scouting way of looking at it is he's great at diagnosing plays before the snap, but when the yeah. bodies start flying, he has trouble improvising and realizing, oh crap, this is not how I saw it coming, and then how to um, uh, I, you know, improvise off of that. So they actually designed hot routes into the plays themselves, the set plays. Normally, if it's a Peyton Manning, he sees a blitz coming, he's going to audible to a hot route to, say, like Reggie Wayne or, or Demarius Thomas. Um, instead, Alex Smith, he gets to the play. There's already a hot route embedded in the play itself so that he doesn't have to try to make adjustments. The play happens. He he feels the heat. He no, immediately knows where the hot route is. So I thought that that's was really, really that's really interesting because he's an, yeah. he's an exceptionally smart quarterback, and the, I don't think it's a small sample size in terms of interception avoidance. Like that one year was flukishly low, but he clearly is good at that. It's clearly his so. is to not force the ball into okay into dangerous places. He is a very smart quarterback, and I actually think he I, – I believe he announced one of the, the games when he was injured, at a, the, one of the London games. Is that right, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I heard he I, – like, I just hear he really knocked that out of the park. I actually think there's a very good chance we start talking about Alex Smith in like 10 years as the next John Madden. Like I think he might end up being a really amazing announcer who breaks down the game for us beautifully. So I like him. I like him as a person. I just don't buy him as a, as a clutch quarterback. <laughs> So I want Jason Campbell always, to be an offensive coordinator, and we want Alex. Yes, to Alex Smith to be an announcer. <laughs> but there's always a team that makes kind of an unexpected jump. Every year it's like, oh, I like this team to get better, and then they mutantly get way better. So there's always a couple of teams. I don't think the Chiefs are it, but they're going to improve, and so they play the Raiders twice. So The 49ers you know, were that two years ago, and I didn't expect that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, everybody said the Niners are going to get better. You know, they're going to improve. They're going to be 8-8, eight 9-7, eight, and seven, but then massive jump forward. So we might see the same thing with the Chiefs. I just don't think so. Right. I have a team later that I like for the big jump that's going to surprise both of you. <laughs> well, we got to we gotta, we gotta start moving on, though, right? we got to get through the rest of the teams. I guess so. Um, no, uh, anyone care to talk about the Chargers? I mean, they uh, they're yeah. better off with their, with their coach fired, but I'm not a Phillip Rivers fan for some reason. North Turner is perfectly good with quarterbacks, and he's regressed every one of the last four years. I can't explain it, but I don't see him suddenly rediscovering his all-pro form. Yeah, I think, I think if Rivers was going to do it by now, he would have done it. I think he's like a slightly more talented Tony Romo, who, who just can't quite get it done. I don't, I don't like the about. pick of, I don't like the pick of Manti Teo. It's like, you know, you can't replace Junior Seau. You know, I, it's, I don't like, I didn't like that pick when it happened. It feels like kind of one of those name picks and not a pick based on a guy who's got NFL athleticism 
and first round talent. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't particularly like the Chargers this year. Right. Uh, Danny Woodhead's another guy. They signed Danny Woodhead. To me, he was just this perfect Bill Belichick second, you know, second string guy out of that system in San Diego. It's just, yeah, it, do, it doesn't feel like a good signing. I, I just, I, I don't think the Chargers are making wise choices at this point. I think they're flailing desperately because they have, they, I feel like they felt like they had the talent to make the Super Bowl and it didn't quite work. And now when they should be blowing up and rebuilding, they're desperately flailing to make another. They're Chargers. signing the wrong right wide receivers. Robert Meacham was obviously a mistake, but just signing the the wrong wide wide receivers, Eddie Royal, etc. Hopefully they've improved that this year for their fans, but I don't, I don't think so. Right. All right. Well, uh, moving on, let's uh, go to the uh, AFC North. Um, we got the Ravens, the Steelers, the Bengals, the Browns. Uh, obviously, the Ravens, unfortunately, probably a sore mark for you guys. Um, you know, uh, eh, it's okay. Do the, uh, you know, it's kind of hard. It seems like a pretty weak division. It feels like, obviously, Ravens lost a lot of players. They're going to be rebuilding. Steelers are kind of, they're always solid, but it doesn't seem like they've found anyone real special to help push them over the edge because they lost Mike Wallace. And then Bengals, they're like slow and steady improving, which is good for them. And I think I think the Bengals are my dark horse to make the Super Bowl this year. I think they're going to be great. Who? You guys watch, you guys watch Hard Knocks? No. I, I haven't I love, watched it this I year. love Hard Knocks. I love I Hard Knocks. And so you feel close to the Bengals because you're watching all those all those players week to week. And I love the big uh, Estonian guy they have. Uh, what's his name? Their second round draft pick this year. Oh, it's bothering me. I don't remember his name, but he's hilarious on the show. Like he's got, he's six foot eight and like huge. And Margus like, Hunt. Margus Hunt. He's hilarious. Like he's got a super dry sense of humor. So even though he's six eight, it feels like they put you on the football field because he <laughs> interacts with all the players. Like he's super dry, quick witted. I enjoy him. I, I like their defense. It all depends on who Andy Dalton is. And is, Andy Dalton, is Andy Dalton going to make the leap or isn't he? Because if he is, then this team could contend. If he's not, then 9-7 and seven again in first-round exit. Because they have good receivers. They have two good tight ends now with Tyler Eifert and Gresham. They have a solid defense. Like, where's the, where's the weaknesses on this team? However, nobody likes them to contend because – their quarterback seems average, even though I'm I feel not sure. Like they keep getting better, and the numbers keep getting good, really good. I mean, A.J. Green is now, like, one of the top wide receivers in the league. I, I think Andy Dalton's going to make the leap. Like, whereas I don't think that um, some of the other quarterbacks we've talked about and we're going to talk about are, have that leap in them, I think that Andy Dalton does have that. Well, I think the... the hunch. You know, scouting-wise, Dalton can be accurate in the short and mid-range. It's his... Uh, it's his you know, deep ball, yeah. Deep, deep ball, ball is tough. Uh, it, it's not been good based on uh, Football Outsiders' uh, numbers. Where do they rank him? Like, how, how bad is his deep ball problem? Uh, I'd have, have to look it up, but um, it, it, it's not great when you are trying to compare him to, uh, you know, if he is the one that's supposed to make the leap. You know, it, it right now like it's not exactly the greatest comparison, but it seems like his ceiling is another Matt Shaw, basically. You know, someone who you know is not going to lose you any games, who can uh, orchestrate an offense, but there's going to be times where if uh, it's questionable whether you think he's going to, you know, really, you know, uh, uh, make that big play that you need. Yeah, and, and I hear that. Guy, like that's a thing. Fourth quarter. You know, you're coming down, the quarterback steps on the field. Has it ever terrified you to hear Matt Schaub steps on the field with two <laughs> minutes to go? Like, everybody just goes, oh, that's right, it's Matt Schaub. He might make a play, but chances are not so much. And is Andy Dalton going to figure that out this year? Was, Mon was Montana's long ball really that, I mean, if football outsiders are going to dissect that? Montana was perfect at everything. The long ball, the short ball. <laughs> The accurate strike, the he handsomeness. He definitely terrified you if he came on the field. <laughs> but, yeah, if Joe Montana stepped on the field with two minutes to go in that super calm way of his, as a fan of the other team, you're legitimately terrified you're going to lose the game, even if you have a great defense. It's like with Tom Brady, with hey, Peyton man. Manning, with all great quarterbacks, you're just like, 
oh man, we have a lead, but we're not going to win this game because that dude's going to kill us. He's going to he's going to march down and kill us. Elway, all those guys. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. I don't think Andy Dalton's going to be that, but I think I think Andy Dalton's going to be better than Joe Flacco. He won a Super Bowl. Joe Flacco just won a Super Bowl against our team and put up 34 points on the board. So I don't love Joe Flacco, but. I have to give him some credit for a Super Bowl championship. I do have champion. to give him some credit, but I still feel like there's just magic in the air. That it's, it felt like as soon as that team hit the playoffs, all the X factors came right. Ray Lewis, I don't know, something was. It just felt like it was there the year somehow. But I, had you put Matt Schaub in Joe Flacco's place last year, I don't think the the Ravens win the Super Bowl. Yes, I think Joe Flacco. He had, a, he had a hot hand. He throws a great deep ball. Although I don't know if Football Outsiders backs me up, but he feels <laughs> like he's a great deep ball. But I'm not arguing about I'm arguing about Andy Dalton and not Matt Schaub. Matt Schaub. I agree about Matt Schaub. But you think Andy? I, I like Andy Dalton. I hope I hope I hope he makes a jump this year because he seems like a good guy on our team. team. <laughs> so the team that I, I think is going to win this division is the Cleveland Browns. I love the Cleveland Browns this year. Interesting. I know I know they have Brandon Weed in their quarterback, but I love Trent Richardson. I love their new coach. I think they've installed an entirely new culture. I just feel like Cleveland Brown, they're going to have a decent schedule and playing division that's overrated. I feel like the Cleveland Browns are going to just be unexpectedly good this year. That's my weird mutant good team pick this year. There's okay. got to be one weird mutant team. Here's the thing about the Browns. Uh, again, I'd have to find it in the Football Outsiders thing, but they try to break down the exact hierarchy of leadership. Um, yeah. The owner, who is, I think, under investigation right now for something really shady. Uh, and then you've got Mike Lombardi, who I like because he's on the BS Report. He was on the BS Report a lot. He sounds like a... Yeah, I, I, listen to, I listen to Mike Lombardi a lot. It might be like a... It might be a, a, a choice based on the fact that I admire Mike Lombardi. but Right, but the problem is there's also eight other names involved in the power structure. So the question, again, has in the long term is, uh, are they going to be going in the right direction? Do they have... Are they, are they a functional franchise? Can they, can they move on from Brandon Whedon this year if he's not the guy, which is very possible? Yeah, so that, that's my concern... And, yeah, I mean, this division, I don't know who, who comes out on top. I think it's like a three-way race to meh. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't, I don't particularly like the Ravens. I, everybody's like, oh, we didn't lose any leadership. Like, this team, it's, like, just built in. I'm, I just don't buy that. Like, you lost so many defensive leaders and talent. I just don't buy that this can be the same type of team. It's so it's awesome that... Some point not only lose your heart and soul, you lose your arms, your legs, and your torso. You're just not the same animal anymore. I don't, I don't fear that defense anymore. And it's just so often in this day and age that one of the two teams that didn't make the Super Bowl, that makes the Super Bowl, doesn't make the playoffs next year. And if I had to pick the team to do that, it's, it's the Ravens. It's not the Niners. You're not taking the 49ers? <laughs> 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 uh, all right. So, and in the South, we've got the Texans, the Colts, the Titans, and the Jaguars. I mean, you know, we kind of yeah. talked about Matt Schaub. Texans Colts. obviously have J.J. Watt, who, you know, hopefully, you know, statistically and, like, advanced metrics-wise, arguably had the, the greatest defensive season of all time, which is pretty <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, a lot, obviously a lot of people are Colts. Colts um, football outsiders project them to regress. Uh, for... One of the close games last year. I read a, I read a Grantland article by Bill Barnwell, which is basically the same kind of thing. Listen, they just they had too many things go their way. They had that emotional roller coaster. It just feels like this is a a six and ten team last year that mutantly went ten and six or nine and seven, whatever they went. So I don't I don't like them this year either. Well, and while I agree with both of me, what's the team that's going to do it here? I mean, I guess it's the Texans. The Texans. It's not the Titans or the Jaguars. Why are the Texans going to be much worse? Like, I get that they might regress a little bit, but why are they going to be way worse? I just, I it like them just, better. If you than... watched them at the end of the year last year, they imploded. Yeah. Like, they were a lock for the, the division in, so, in the so home field please, please make me a case for the Titans or the Jaguars. So I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, my case I mean, for the Titans is that Randy Fitzpatrick oh. is a really brilliant quarterback. That's, no, there's no case. I don't know. <laughs> 
Ryan Fitzpatrick. I didn't even get his name right. Yeah, no, let's, no, the, the, the Titans over yeah, those no. two teams. <laughs> the Titans are Jake Locker. What's funny about this is I always look at a team and go, everybody in the world knows already, or a hundred percent of the world knows, Blaine Gabbert is not a franchise quarterback. But because they're invested in their own decision, they're going to give it one more year or two more years or however long it finally takes them to realize they drafted Akili Smith and not Joe Namath. And then with Jake Locker, 95% of the world knows, you know, by the time you're on your third year and you still just suck out loud, at what point does management go, listen, we we blew it and let's restart? Because most of the time... I'm not do sure it Jake Locker finishes Wayne the season Gabbard, this year. He's just so obviously not the guy, yet they don't have the fortitude to make Chad Henney the guy or sign a guy like Jason Campbell or sign a guy who is an average NFL quarterback. They don't have the fortitude to do that. So they plug in the golden boy who's handsome and he throws an occasional good pass, but he's not going to run an NFL offense to more than six wins. You don't, so you don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is a somewhat average, like you're comparing Jason Campbell? like Ryan you know, Fitzpatrick's not starting for either of these teams. No, he's, no, no, but he's the backup for the Titans who – Yeah. You're saying they're not bringing in... Jake Locker starting for the Titans, unless I'm wrong. No, he is. Okay. But you were saying they weren't bringing in anybody because they signed Ryan Fitzpatrick this year. Okay, well, guys, I'm, we just spent two minutes talking about actually, the Titans and the Jaguars. Okay, we're <laughs> done We're done with the Titans and the Jaguars. You're talking about this. the backup quarterback to the Titans. <laughs> All right. Yes, let's, we let's blow through the rest of the list. To more important things like the uh, AFC East where I think it's pretty fair to say the Patriots should run away. They have to win it all. You think Patriots are going to win it all? Interesting. I said Jets win it all, and I'm, I'm kidding. The Jets. Oh, okay, apparently he's... Let's not waste any time with the Jets. Everybody said everything they have to have to say about the Jets. <laughs> I, I don't like Miami that much because I feel like Miami, the team that makes all these big, splashy signings and signs sometimes troubled guys like your Mike Wallace... I feel like those are the teams that usually underperform expectations. I like Ryan Tannehill. I like some of their young players, but I don't like the team trying to rush to process by installing these these guys. So I don't like the Dolphins this year. The Bills, I like the direction, but not their chances this year. So yeah, I like the Bills' direction, but, but yeah, they're not there yet. The Patriots are going to win this division. They're going to do it with a bunch of receivers we've never heard of. And unless Tom Brady gets, you know, hit by – Pollard again. <laughs> Even like, if he does, like it's not like I didn't name. <laughs> yeah. I think they still win the division. There's going to be a new Matt Castle, and it'll be fine. Well, yeah, think, I mean, they're pretty high on Ryan Mallett. Uh, yeah, Ryan Mallett. So yeah. who knows? They uh, must be if they liked him over Tim Tebow. So they must be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like saying you know a coat hanger is uh, chosen over Tim Tebow, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I love everybody who always says like. I don't know why Tim Tebow doesn't get a chance because of all those wins. He won games. He just wins football games. It always makes me crazy. I'm like, yeah, they won football games, but he was terrible at quarterback. Like, how many more football games would they have won if they had somebody to throw the ball and complete more than 55% of his passes? I just, I don't understand the, like, well, they won. They went to the playoffs. I'm like, well, the rest of the team did a pretty good job then because they did it despite having a legitimately terrible guy at throwing passes, passing the ball. I do understand it to some extent, though, because the Broncos that year looked terrible with the with the, before Tebow started for them, and then when Tebow started starting for them, they still looked terrible, but they kept somehow magically winning games. It did feel a little like Tebow magic. It Until was a he like played a he really the good power game. of God, he had the power of God. <laughs> I, I don't have any other rational explanation. He's, he, I mean, he's a good with his he's a good running quarterback. I really want to see somebody convince Tim Tebow to be an H back or tight end. Like, yes. I don't understand why a guy with that much talent can't be converted yeah. to another position. I feel like position. he's got football in him. Maybe he needs to sit a season. Maybe he just needs to have somebody. Maybe he has to have a season out of football, and then another team say, "We'll we'll we'll take you on, but you got to be a fullback or a halfback." Yeah, so I hope that happens because I don't want to see him fail, but I don't like him as a quarterback at all. I just don't yep. think he's good at quarterbacking. Yeah, I don't think you can learn the skill complete accuracy. You know what I mean? Like, the ability to read the field and make accurate passes, you can get better, but I don't think you can just go from a 50% passer to a 65% passer. I just You're think now talking talent. about a quarterback who's not even playing in the game. Okay, we're... Yeah, I'm sorry. So, Patriots. <laughs> <Patriots. laughs> <laughs> 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 okay, 
All right, so uh, it's probably fair to say that it's probably the Patriots and the Broncos who are probably going to be the top teams in uh, the the AFC. I still uh, thought it's boring, but it's boring, but it's yeah, it's hard to argue those those two. Right, teams. right. Um, so in the NFC, let's stick with the East. Uh, we've got some interesting teams here. We've got wa uh, the Washington team. I refuse to call them by their uh, nickname. Uh, I think. It's yeah, let's change that. What, what's wrong with oh. Hawks or Washington? Why can't, why can't they be? Yeah, why can't they be the Hawks? There's no reason for that. Or the, or the whatever. I mean, it it's is really an absolutely racist name. The, the movement center. that's happening right now, where a lot of people are, you know, trying to, you know, make Dan Snyder aware that you know this nickname is probably should have been banned decades ago. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. I'm not. I'm, I want to make it clear that I'm not against the like Cleveland Indians. I'm not against the Atlanta Braves. Those are perfectly acceptable. Like, yeah, they're mascots, and we're we're exploiting American I Indians, and you can have a problem that. with it. I don't. I think that's fine. I think we're honoring them. We have the 49ers. We've got plenty of historical figures. But Redskins is a racist slur. It's literally a racist slur. It has the word skin in it. It should. <laughs> yeah. It certainly should be the first. I could argue the other the other names, the Seminoles or whatever, but this one should be the first to go. Just gone. If yeah. someone a hundred years from the future traveled to the past and they're like, "Tell us a wise one. What's what's one of the worst things we're doing in sports right now?" I'd be like, "You have a team named the Redskins. <laughs> Racist <laughs> assholes like changed that team name yesterday. In the future, we're laughing at you because that's terrible." Right. All right. So politics aside, um, we've got Washington. <laughs> we've got the Eagles with the Chip Kelly craziness. We've got the Steady Giants, and the always uh, way louder than their more style than substance Cowboys. Sorry to my friend Justin, uh, but uh, <laughs> which which of those teams uh, interest you guys the most? Cowboys, I don't feel have, like have gotten better. I feel like they're no. running in place. So I don't necessarily think they're going to be terrible, but I don't know why I should expect them to be better. The Giants are schizophrenic. They seem to do well anytime people go like, oh, the Giants are boring, they're not going to do well. That's the time they seem to rise and crush you. I feel like the Giants always have they, – they, it's like every other year. There's like a year they suck, there's a year they're good. I mean, that's even true during the season. There's a game they suck and a game they're good. So I think this is the year they come back and they're good again. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is I feel like this year everybody's counting out the Giants because they're they're, you know, they didn't do that great last year. But I feel like they'll they'll probably put it together this year. What's what's different from two years ago when I mean there's not much difference. Right. I mean, well, yeah, it, it's interesting. Obviously, it, it's odd to hear a New York team be the least splashiest off-season team of yeah. this division. But uh, they the didn't do much team, of anything. The other thing to again siphon off of more uh, football outsider stuff is they they heavily look upon uh, strength of schedule as uh, a big factor in your team's regular season success, and the Giants for some reason year in year out will always have a significantly easier first eight games and a significantly harder uh, last eight games. Like they're projected again this really? season, upcoming season to have that again, and so that's why every time uh, you hear talks about oh, they did great, and then now there's a half mid-season collapse, or, oh, it's winter, Ta Coughlin doesn't know what the hell he's doing, oh, it's cold, Eli can't throw the ball well. No, it's just simply the strength of the it's opponent. It's a harder schedule. Like, Plus, they have, they have, Hakeem Nix was never right last year. They have David Wilson in his second year could emerge. Ruben Randall just going to get better. Victor Cruz is still, still young. Like, Eli Manning, I feel like, still kind of his good prime years, like, there's a lot to like about this team winning this division because the Eagles are a massive question mark. Like I, you know, the Eagles, they could, they it could, could go one fifteen and one and one and fifteen. Yeah. I don't. I couldn't tell you which because, like, Chip Kelly is he a genius or is he crazy? Because it feels oh. to me like installing Michael Vick as like a quick trigger, no huddle guy seems crazy. You know, it seems like it's not going to work at all. But I don't know, like, all, all the reports coming out of there are like they're playing fast, they're not thinking too much, but they're going to put a bunch of plays on the board, like, it's it going to be interesting. It comes down to Vic being injured. Like, that guy isn't going to play 16 games. So however long he's injured, that's how many games they ultimately lose. Well, the trouble is they weren't good with Vic last year. No, that's Vic true. Is, I mean... And, and that's still a question mark. But even if they're great, even if Vic is doing well under this new offense, he's going to be out a few games. Yeah. He doesn't yeah, get the calls. Any, any good. 
Um, Plus, he's so different. Like, if Nick Foles is a little bit good, which I'm not sure he is, he's so different in style than Vic. Like, how are you running the same kind of offense? It's the same time when they were doing the Cobb Vic thing, uh, the Cobb McNabb thing, yeah. Well, yeah. Again, um, I think this might have, might be from uh, Smart oh, Football, but they were talking about the spread. And again, we still don't know what Chip Kelly's going to be busting out because, of course, he's going to be all t- top secret. Like, he's like J.J. Abrams of football or something like that. Um, so we don't know what kind of offense he's busting out, but uh, this, this uh, website, Smart Football, they talked about there's ways of doing the read option where you're actually not running the ball with the quarterback. You're kind of you're, you're still forcing um, a defensive tackle to look. And yeah. so kind of your way, as long as you have LaShawn McCoy being healthy and running all over the place, you just have that constant threat, and that freezes the defense enough to give you that window of opportunity to either throw – or to, you know, just hand the ball off to LaShawn and let him do his thing. Yeah, we'll just have to see. So you could potentially... They have, with they have weapons. Am I right, though, that Macklin is out? He's out for the year, right? Yeah, that, that I think that's going to be a big hit because yeah. he's obviously their most reliable uh, receiver. Yeah, he's my favorite receiver on that team. He's I like Macklin guy. a lot. Uh, what about the Redskins, though? I mean, the Redskins are the other one that could threaten this, this division. They're projected from football outsiders to win this division. They're... Interesting. Um, yes. And I don't know that I disagree. Because the like they're theory, only going to get better from last year. Yeah, the theory is, you know, Arakpo's going to be back, so their defense is going to be uh, crazy good. And I love uh, Alfred Morris. Yeah, th- you know, they've got a full year of Alfred Morris with, you know, the chemistry with the offensive line, and the theory is that we don't know about RG3's health in the future, but he should be healthy enough for one more season <laughs> or yeah. something like that, you know? So, so that's, that's what they're banking on, even though I don't know who their wide receivers are other than Pierre Garçon, who's kind of overrated, in my opinion. Oh, of course. He's, he's, also, he's also got a nagging injury. Oh, but, right. yeah, Pierre Garçon, I think, was he, – he got a lot, of those, a lot of those scramble catches last year. Like, he got a lot of big plays on broken plays. I'm not saying there's no skill involved in that, but it felt like he was wandering free occasionally because teams – He's also not one of the most crazy. ridiculous names in football. Pierre Garçon. Pierre Garçon. I mean, you really? hate French people. That's tough. You hate the French. Pierre, but he's, he's basically Paul Boy. His name is Paul but Boy. But you're basically saying Pierre Garçon, which is quintessentially French. You're saying you hate it out of hand. That's tough. I hate all French people. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I like the Redskins if Robert Griffin III is healthy, but that's a big if. It's hard to project because if he's not healthy, I don't like them nearly as much. That's true. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of the most. It's probably the most interesting. Uh, one of the most interesting divisions uh, to watch this season. Um, moving on, uh, we've got the in the South. We've got the Falcons and the Saints, who probably will be, you know, are probably considered the the front runners. And then we've got the Panthers, which Football Outsiders also is very bullish about. And then we've got the Bucks. So there's a lot of actually. Interesting yeah, that's an interesting too. division. I think that I think the Saints are back this year. I mean, if Pey- with Sean Payton back on the line of scrimmage, I think it's going to be a big deal. I know, like Bill Simmons is. Uh, he's big into like uh, like uh, some the intangible stuff. So like he thinks there's going to be an fu mode. <laughs> <laughs> so the, they're the going Saints, to be running up the Saints the, are going to be in, in FU mode. Yeah, so they'll be running up the, sc- the score like the Patriots did in 07. <laughs> there, were other, there were other concerning signs for the Saints besides lack of coaching last year. Uh, the lack of any kind of consistent running game, the one-dimensional offense, the really atrocious defense. Like Sean Payton, I think, is going to improve the, the coaching there, but can he, can he coach players to be faster, better defenders? I'm not 100% sure he can. But when Sean Payton was coach, it's not like he had this amazing defense. But they were they were average. Like the year they won the Super Bowl, they coaxed like this this really aggressive blitzing average defense out of them. And last year they weren't close to average. They were they were terrible. And I'm, and I don't think that they're going to be dominant. I just think that, and I'm not even going to say they're going to win the division for sure. I just think that they're they're better than they were last year. But yeah, I agree. Make a case that the Falcons. The Falcons should be as good as they were last year, given the youth of their offense, yeah. the improvement of their defense. They should I'm, be I'm as good as last year. I'm beginning to have serious doubts about Matt Ryan. 
I'm beginning to think he's with another Matt Shaw, who just, he's, he's really talented, really good, shouldn't be anything wrong, but just can't seem to get it done. If he was going to get it done, wasn't he going to do it by now? Well, it's tough for Matt Ryan because first it was, you never want a playoff game, you bum. Can he get that monkey off his back? He did. He won a playoff game. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Team of the championship game, he threw for like 4,600 yards. He has a passer rating of like 100. Like, he had a legitimately good season where he led his team to the championship, but because his team lost, barely, he's still pilloried as like a, an also ran. I like Matt Ryan. And I like Matt Ryan, too. I just I have to throw it out there as like, I'm not sure. That is he Can he win the big one? I think he can. He's not the guy who I think I worry about winning the big one. I just think he's not defense, anything, I don't think because his defense didn't help him in either the Hawks or the Niners game. Like, would both when both these comebacks happen, they weren't all on the offense. Some of it was that, that they didn't but move that's, the ball. But that's a good point. Is there... But is their defense any better? I mean, their defense isn't different. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but I like them to win this division more so than I like the Saints. I hate the Bucks this year. I think they're going to be terrible. And the Panthers, I think they'll improve this year. I, I agree with those things. Say, listen, there were a lot of close games last year. They have a quarterback that should be improving um, even though Carolina's made some historically bad re-signs for high dollar values, I still I like this Cam team. To... I, I think what, what Mike Wilbon says about Cam Newton is completely accurate. He's very much like he, he plays very similar to the way Ben Roethlisberger does, and I think we're just seeing a little bit of that second-year regression, and he's going to be much better this year. I mean, there's, the, the problem is he doesn't have anybody to throw to except like a 40, I mean, I'm sorry, 75-year-old receiver named Steve Smith. But I love Steve Smith, but he is getting old. He strikes yeah. me as the kind of guy who they'll have to they'll have to like drag him like Ricky Henderson out of the game. Like he'll be forty five. <laughs> they'll convince he's can play. Like they'll have to be like Steve Smith, we cut you five years ago. He's like, I can still play. Like they'll have to drag him out of the game, kicking and screaming. As long as he can still burn cornerbacks the way he does, then yeah. Yeah. Because he, he caught he had a, a he had 1174 yards receiving last year. Like he's really he's old. He should be like way past his prime, but he's yeah. still catching a lot of balls. Like some of that's because he's the only guy there to do that. Right, that's fair, fairish, yeah. But he's not he's not crazy injury prone. I mean, he's he's still for, for his age, he's doing great. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's terrible when you start talking about these crazy old players and you start realizing you're talking about guys your age. That sucks. Well, we I hit that point a little while ago. You're just now. <laughs> I'm hitting that point right about now. Because how old is Steve Smith? He's like 36. No, I think he's like 34 or 35. Yeah, 30. Oh yeah, he's my age. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but they have Luke Keckley on defense, who I love. Yeah, yeah Luke like Keckley is like the flash of the NFL because. Yeah, but he, was he a fluke? Or... No, I like that guy a lot. You don't think he's a fluke? No, I don't think so. Yeah, they're very, they're very high so. on him. Everybody loves him. Uh, like I think I forgot where I think it might have been Barnwell who said who believes you know they have the best front seven uh, in on defense. That that should really help them. Obviously, the biggest X factor for the Panthers is they do have a potentially very dumb coach in Ron Ver Rivera. Yeah, I'm not sold on Ron Rivera. That's that's a thing. Is I, I'm not sold on him at all. I don't know why he's still coaching really. Right. Um, yeah, and they're they're uh, you know the football outsiders. They're they're the way the way they they see it is the Panthers are so talented that they could win in spite of their coach. We'll see. Sometimes I mean, that's tough though, because I remember I remember the cases being made for the Niners really regressing last year, and you saw their record. It did a little bit, even though I think they were a better football team. They regressed a little bit record wise, but a good coach can 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 negate some of that damage. Like a good coach is going to make a team perform above expectations and keep a team sharp and focused for the weeks you expect them to, to have a down game. And Ron Rivera just hasn't got it done. He's, you know, he's shuffled blamed as coordinators at a couple different points. Like I just don't, I just, it's hard to feel like Ron Rivera Super Bowl coach is ever going to happen, but maybe, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. Right. I just think they're better than they were last year, and that doesn't mean they win the division, but I, I think they, they, they show they're more promise. I think they do have to make a change of coach, though. Right. Yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, for me, the South, I have no idea who's going to come out of that. 
for the uh, NFC North. North. I think it's fair to say the Packers probably yeah. should be uh, uh, favored to win that division. And then you've got this weird mix of the Vikings, the Lions, and the Bears. The Vikings, you know, if you believe in regression to the mean, probably will not make the playoffs again. I hate. I like, the, I like Detroit for the opposite reason. They seem to be a yeah. team that's poised to just win more games, is based on not, not having fluky things happen. Yeah, they've been unlucky in a few aspects uh, that Barnwell definitely touched on. The they, are from, they are from Detroit, which is the primary thing that, that's unlucky for them at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I'd like the Saints to do better this year, but I do have to admit, I'm not, I'm not liking the way that team plays on the field. I really want to like Ndamukong Sue, but that guy on the field's coming off like a jerk. I'm sorry. Like, every time I see him interviewed, he's a nice guy. <laughs> but when he's on the field, he's doing some pretty dick things. They're not yeah. playing super... Their, their defense is not going to be invited to any of my tea parties in the future. <laughs> they seem just rude, and they do mean things. <laughs> they're not invited. If my daughter has a tea party, they're out. All those guys. Plus, uh, Steven Schwartz seems like kind of an asshole. Like, I know I'm supposed to be on my coach's side. Did I say Steven Schwartz, the composer? No, I meant Jim Schwartz. The <laughs> that makes more sense, yeah. He seems like, he seems like kind of an asshole. I don't remember who you're talking about there. <laughs> I'm like, Steven Schwartz is a terrible football coach, which you'd expect because he's a, he's a composer. For yeah, I'm going to have to Google that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like the Bears kind of have a little bit of that eaglesness to it, where, again, you're bringing in an X factor of a coach. You don't know whether what kind of offense he's really going to bust out, whether they can finally put things together. I mean, I feel like Forte, Cutler, Brandon Marshall obviously should be the cornerstone to a good, yeah. or a very I hate average. Cutler. Uh, what do you got against Cutler? That's a that's a new take. I've never heard anybody who, who doesn't like you don't like Jake Cutler. He seems like such a class guy. There, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I like. So I feel like the opposite. I feel like people are always forgiving that guy. Like, oh, no, man, sitting really? On that, sitting on the sideline that week, it, you know, like, give him some slack. He was really hurt. Sometimes, you, there, when, there's, sometimes when there's smoke, there's fire. If you seem like just a giant petulant asshole at every stage of every football game, there's a good chance you're a petulant asshole. But I don't know. If, like, Mark Trestman is interesting to me for this reason. I, I watched the Niners when he was their offensive coordinator. And he was a really smart, inventive guy. But he seemed to have – he had trouble developing relationships with some of his better players. I don't know if he solved that in the CFL. I don't know if he's – matured in his approach to the game, but I remember him as like a young hotshot who failed with the Niners, so I just, I'm just i predisposed to not think he's going to succeed. But there's 15 years of experience between that experience and yeah. him taking over the reins of the Bears. Does that make sense? Like, maybe he's yeah. a different guy, and he's learned a lot. Well, and he's he was also it. on the Raiders when they made their Super Bowl run uh, with Bill Callahan's group. Is that right? He was on his uh, staff that year. That's right. I, at that time, I don't think I really could... I wouldn't be able to tell, like, how much of an influence he had or whether... And again, Rich Gannon got a lot of credit for being, you know, controlling that offense in that right, season. Right, you know, a lot of credit went to Gruden, and, you know, uh, they, they were the West Coast offense personified at that time. Um, so it would be so a lot of people I think would probably be making comparisons because Charlie Gardner did really well for that team, so they're thinking, oh, yeah. that Forte will be the you know Charlie Gardner role, blah 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 blah. But we have no idea. That was ten years ago. We have no idea like I, what, yeah. what he's going to do. I think they're, they're going to do well during the regular season. I do. I really actually think they're going to put up good numbers. They're going to do well with their record this year. They're going to win a lot of games. I don't like them in the postseason at all, but I do like their regular season record. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't think they're going to win the division, but that's just because they're in the same division as the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, I mean, can I, I, I don't think you can really make a case that the Packers will not win the, that, that division. Seems unlikely. Yeah. Unless Aaron Rodgers gets injured. And even that, we'll see. Um, all right, well, it uh, <laughs> took a while, but I guess we should get to the, the, the big division here. Uh, the big division? Uh, you guys have been eagerly awaiting to talk about, I'm sure. Um, the 49ers. The NFC and the, West. And the, and the, the terrible, dreaded Seattle Seahawks. Three. It's like three years ago, would you be like the best rivalry in like three interdivision? Ago, the Hawks and the Niners, you, people would call you ridiculous. We would. They were. It was literally called the NFC Worst because the, the worst four teams in football were in that division. And now yeah. what, like three of the teams? Well, you're you're cutting the Rams a lot of slack if you're saying three of the teams. Two of the, the Cardinals. Two of the teams. 
It looked, well, it looked like the Rams were going to join when, with Sam Bradford. Like, the year the Niners ended up being great was the year that I was like, okay, we're rebuilding, the Rams are going to take over the division for a while, and we'll be good soon. But then all of a sudden, we just we, we won the division, and we, we made it to the championships that year. Was and suddenly, crazy. Sam Bradford looks like he might not be a franchise quarterback. I was convinced when they, when they drafted him, he started playing there, that they had their guy for 15 years. Yeah, I love Sam Bradford. The first two years. I was huge on him, and I was like, great, we're going to be seeing this guy for 15 years, and suddenly, I don't know if he's the guy. It's really interesting. Right. But it's, I still think he's the guy. I, I... Yeah, but really the story probably here is it is, objectively speaking, it's a, it's a two, you know, two titan race, really, for the West. Yeah. Well, like, here's what you're going to start talking about, the, the football outsider metrics on Kaepernick and how bad they are. Um, no, no, there there aren't metrics that can be conceived by man that put Colin Kaepernick in bad life. I'm pretty sure. I sense a little bit of subjective uh, talk here. Um, no, it's it's completely not subjective. The thing is, I remember when we drafted him and I, I liked him, but I watched him that first preseason. I went, man, this guy is raw. Like he was just pro. Like he threw six interceptions. Even the second year preseason, he looked like he had made steps, but he wasn't ready. Like. This is a guy who threw a lot of picks in the preseason, and the one thing that surprised me when he came in was not the arm, because I saw that. It was not the legs, because we saw that. It was the judgment yeah. and the, the, the arm accuracy downfield and the ability to make some, some touch passes. I just didn't see that. So I'm hoping we weren't watching. I'm hoping we don't see a lot more interceptions this year, and I'm worried we will, because he's got that, like, Brett Favre is my hero, gunslinger mentality. And I hope we have a shot caller on him to be like, channel your inner Alex Smith occasionally. <laughs> I'll make stupid decisions with such a good defense. So that's my one concern is that, that Kaepernick is going to be prone to throwing more intersections than Alex Smith. Yes, and I, I am actually very worried about that too. But I, for me, it's just I, I, I believe in Harbaugh. That guy, I love the, 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 the decision to make him coach. I mean, a lot of that was based on the similarities with Bill Walsh, you know, coming from the same school and – and all that kind of stuff, and he just took us from this terrible, terrible team to a really good team overnight, and I did not expect that. And a lot of credit has to go with the talent we had on the team and the people who've been drafting even before Harbaugh arrived. But I and just it, it really speaks to how bad a coach Mike Singletary was. Yes. Too. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, three. I just feel like Harbaugh always has the answer somehow, even if it's not Kaepernick. I think he's got the answer somewhere. There are the three things that worry me about the Niners this year. One. Vic Fangio's defense tend to regress in year three, and not. It doesn't seem like a statistical aberration because it keeps happening everywhere he's been. I don't know. But we, if part we of that back gets, up with the safeties. We filled our hole. I, I feel like we're aware of it. And this is I probably hope, the I, most I, deepest team that he's ever uh, Vic Fangio is going to have. So they clearly have enough resources to keep plugging in the holes. And and maybe those past chances he got, and the reason why his defenses regressed is because teams felt like, oh, you have this great defense, and they didn't invest draft picks in it, which the Niners have done for him. So I'm hoping that's just a, it's a blip and not a player start tuning them out come year three type of thing. The second thing is they've gotten weirdly tight with money this season where they cut their long snapper, who's better than the guy behind him, to save $500,000, that just feels like one of those decisions that comes back to bite you at a weird moment. So I'm a little weird, I'm a little weird like, why are we in super save money mode? I guess you always are as a football team, but we're, we're cutting our long snapper. We're making Colt McCoy take a paycheck using some weird, like, bringing in Seneca Wallace. I don't know how much truth is behind that, but... Those things aren't particularly good for morale of a professional football team when you feel like your ownership is desperately trying to save every dime off the people performing on Sunday. So that's the second thing that worries me. Oh, yeah. uh, however, the thing that I like is that I, I don't, I'm not a great admirer of Pete Carroll as an NFL coach, so I feel like even though the Niners have some issues and they have depth at wide receiver problems, the Seahawks are coached by Pete Carroll, who's a big raw rod douchebag. And I love Russell Wilson, but I agree about Pete Carroll. I don't. I think he. It's so funny to me that Pete Carroll, like you look at the sidelines, and Jim Harbaugh looks like the dick on the sideline. He's always angry. He's always yelling at the refs. And Pete Carroll's the nice, smiley, friendly guy you have over for dinner. But ultimately, Pete Carroll's the guy who was 
probably embroiled in some really bad stuff at USC and got out just before all those suspensions came down. And Jim Harbaugh has been pretty clean, actually. He just and Carol and Carol players professionally, they they've been hit with a lot of performance enhancing drug suspensions. And I know that's not on the coach. He's not out there giving syringes as much as I'd like to believe that. He's still running a program that isn't clean. And I know their players are super mad at Harbaugh for saying for saying shit like, hey, our players aren't dirty like yours are. But to me, that just adds to these, the spice of these games because I think the teams legitimately don't like each other. Yes. They're both good. They both hate each other's coaches. The coaches really hate each other. Like Not like fake, like professional wrestling hate each other. These guys don't respect <laughs> each other. It's just going to make for a fun... A, fun football time. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be fun. I hate playing in their building, but I like our chances in ours. Yeah. And, and I love a lot of the things the Seahawks are doing. Russell Wilson is great. The defense is great. If you keep having Skittles for Marshawn Lynch, he's going to keep scoring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Russell bad. Wilson is just a good... He's a good quarterback. I hate to say it, but he's he's good. I think that guy's like... I think he's the real deal. Yeah, he's the real deal. He's going to be good for a long time, although... I've been wrong before about that. Well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, there's to the talk of, you know, they, they call it the Gang of Four, which is you know, you've got RG3, Andrew Luck, Kaepernick, and uh, Russell Wilson all basically bust onto the seam having uh, outstanding rookie seasons, uh, yeah. depending on yeah. whether you call Kaepernick a rookie or not. But we've seen, like, some rookies regress. Obviously, Cam Newton immediately comes to recent mind. You'd think not all four are going to keep, you know, going straight up for year two. So, it'd be so who, who are your regression candidates? Is is the interesting question. If I had to yeah. choose one, I choose. Man, it's hard to choose Andrew Luck because I feel like they put a good situation around him, and he's tough quarterbacks and get better in year two. Man, that's a tough question. If I had to choose one, I'd probably say Kaepernick, even though it pains me. Yeah. In terms of just like. Well, the thing who, is, like, first of all, Kaepernick's. Uh, going, you know, going analytics again, sample size is really, really small. So really, we don't quite know on a consistent basis how how he delivers. We know from yeah. a scouting standpoint, yeah, he obviously has bigger, uh, he, he, he's got he, he's got a ceiling and a floor that's way better, you know, more variant than... Uh, and that's still true. Even if I pick him as a, even if I pick him as a guy who might come back a little on interceptions and stuff, he's still a guy who I feel like has as much talent as any of those guys. But if you look at Russell Wilson's stats from the second half of last year or even, like, the last ten games, they're absurd. I mean, those numbers are absurd, especially for a rookie quarterback who's, like, 5'9 in high heels. Like, he, yeah. <laughs> he's good. It, are we looking at, like, the, the history? Are we going to be looking back at history and seeing the, brand, the new quarterback of the next generation, these, like, Cam Newton, RG3, Kaepernick, you know, they're almost like taking Steve Young and his style and making it even – more pronounced, or is it going to be another blip like the McNabb Vic era, where everybody unless they, they, unless they learn how to be like Elway and Young, which is throw first. I don't like any of these guys for a, a long career because yep. at the end of the day, I, I think Robert Griffin can be a great pocket passer who occasionally scrambles. I think the same of Kaepernick. I think the same of Wilson. But if you got if you put them out there where they're running on the outside and you can't teach them to slide, which I'm not sure you can for Griffin. I'm not sure you can for Kaepernick. Then I don't like them for having 15-year careers. It's just tough. I mean, Robert Griffin III is just not built like Cam Newton. He's just not. He's if he's going to take a beating, he's not going to play. You know, he's going to get his knee hurt again, and he's not going to be the same player. So I like these guys all to be Hall of Fame level quarterbacks. Like not even. I like all four to be Hall of Fame quarterbacks if they make that same. Transition that which they have to do again, yeah. which yeah. is because they all have good arms. They all have good arms. They're not just running quarterbacks. All those guys have good arms. The uh, couple things that came to my mind was um, as I think they all blanked out on me, which is fantastic. <laughs> so instead of a couple things come to your mind, it was really zero things that came to your mind. Yes, exactly. Or they came, they came through your mind and then then went out the other. Either that, or they collided, cancel each other out, and then I just suddenly mush. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of bummed that Percy Harvin is injured on the yeah. Seahawks. You know, you kind of want to see both teams 
be yeah, crab, crab tree and Harvin, th those passing attacks are just going to be more potent. So we have to see them both neutered a little bit. Right. I love Harvin, too. Like, I, it sucks that that guy suffers from the migraines he does, but I, I kind of sympathize because my wife gets migraines like that. And I love that he battles through it. I love it. Right. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think um, it'll be interesting to see how they adjust without Crabtree for the Niners because he was their basic deep threat if, I, uh, if I'm familiar with their rosters. And, again, to go, I believe Football Outsiders charted um, Kaepernick to be pretty good on the deep balls, which is why they think he will succeed in the long run yeah. is because, you know, yeah. at times you've got to stretch that field you, you watch him throw, he throws it like a javelin, man. He chucks up. Right, and it's accurate versus, you know, versus, like, a flutterer like, you know, Matt Leinertz used to be. But I think somebody else will emerge as the deep threat other than Crabtree. It's either going to be Vernon Davis again or, you know... One guy I like is Quentin what? Patton. Their fourth-round draft pick this year. I like him a lot. Like, you're not going to see him in weeks one or two, but keep an eye out for him in week six-plus because I like him a lot. He's a hard worker. He looks fast, like... More than Kyle Williams, more than Marlon Moore, more than most of these other second receivers, he looks like he has a talent uh, to be a legitimate replacement for Michael Crabtree. Right. So yeah. my question for you two Niner fans, then, uh, two questions is, are you concerned about uh, Justin Smith's uh, age uh, as an issue? Because obviously we saw last year he was a big factor in how successful Alden Smith was. Uh, in in doing their stunts and uh, just creating havoc up front, and how afraid are you of the Seahawks, or are you afraid of any other NFC teams? Well, for my answer, you want to answer first? Yeah, then? I'm very I'm I'm very concerned about the Justin Smith thing. I'm not concerned like I'm very concerned about the Justin Smith thing because I do. I mean, he's playing, so it's fine. But when he's not playing, Alvin Smith, he. I really feel when I watch the, the field, Justin Smith is the guy making the plays, and Alvin Smith is the one getting the, the stats with the sacks. That's, that's, I mean, they're both very talented dudes. But, so I am concerned about that. That's a, that, but there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot of concerns. It's my team. Uh, as far as concern about any other NFC teams, no. I mean, as long as we play our game, I think we're going to be fine. I think the Seahawks match up super well against us because the teams that do well against the Niners right now are not the teams with the marquee quarterbacks and the great wide receivers and these fancy offenses. It's the guys that have got one running back that they can stick to for two, two full seasons, even though we've been beating him to death, and he still runs well against us. And the Marshawn Lynch-style offenses with a good quarterback like Russell Wilson behind them who can who can – do small dump off passes. Those are good. It's a good matchup. So it worries me about beating them, but I still think we take the division. Rick, what I'll say, what I'll say about the Justin Smith thing is, yes, he's obviously an important part of our defense. But if you watch the Niners closely last year, about week nine or ten, their running defense started to suffer, and that that was before the Justin Smith injury. I don't know exactly what happened. I, I want to put part of the blame on decreased play of Isaac Sopalaga and, and maybe some injuries that weren't being talked about. But their run defense went from being world-class, we don't ever allow touchdowns or even five yards to carry to any team, to a little ordinary. And you saw that in the Seahawks game last year. And so I don't think it's just Justin Smith. I think that was a little bit too overstated in terms of the impact he had when he was injured. He's probably – the most important player in our defense. But I think no, no, the no. post-tackle was important. I think the play of um, Ray McDonald wasn't quite as good as the season wore on. So you had this front that I hope has been rejuvenated with adding Ian Williams from the practice team to the regular team and uh, Glenn Dorsey to that line. I hope Justin Smith is healthy this year. But, yeah, that, that run defense – when it's at its best, is so stout it forces the teams to have to pass. And the and Seahawks learned they could they could get us. And it was weird. As a Niners fan, you were always like, yeah, go ahead and try to run. That's funny. That's very cute. You know, keep us honest. Ha ha. And then the Hawks would hand off to Marshawn Lynch and he would gash us. And it made our defense like on its heels and they, they crushed us one that year, last year in their stadium. Well, and here's, here's my – I just want to say one thing real fast about my amateur opinion about another reason I think that the, the defense the, – the run defense might have struggled is I think that we were really realizing that we had these giant holes in, uh, in, in our 
middle, uh, like our cornerbacks were solid, but our safety, the middle of the field was becoming a problem. So they were dropping back our linebackers like Patrick Willis, who I actually think is the most important person on our defense. And I think he was covering those, the, those positions and not looking to, to stop the run as much at that point because I felt like we felt like the teams were afraid to run on us. And I think that we drafted some good safeties, and I'm hoping they pay off. And I think Well, that Eric, Eric Reed looks good. Yeah. Like, Niners don't start you if you're not ready to start, and he's starting. He looks good. So, so yeah, I love Willis. He's one of my favorite players, and he's probably my favorite player in the NFL right now. And, and, and Bowman's no slots either. Those are two yeah. really good middle linebackers. Yeah. Um, the one thing that interests me a little bit is seeing how well LaMichael James makes an impact mm. because That's they true. probably should be d dialing down Frank Gore and now you're going to have two potentially good backups in LaMichael James and um, the other Kendall guys. Hunter. Kendall Hunter. Yeah, Kendall Hunter. I, I love Anthony Dixon. Like, that guy's underrated to me. Okay, then, well, you, you know, you have a lot of really interesting running backs and, of course, their, you know, their offensive line is, you know, probably one of the league's best right now. They have the best guard right now in Yapudi, Yap. I uh, put it, whatever I can't say. You body. <laughs> Mike, you body. There you go. But yeah. I know because my daughter sound makes it, it thinks it sounds funny, so it's Mike. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Um, Alex Boone, uh, you know, Joe Staley, like those, I mean, that's that's a good line. Alex Boone's vastly underrated. Uh, it's just it's just a good line, one through five. The center's getting a little old, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, you line anybody up. The, the thing, though, is, is that Michael James, when Kendall Hunter was healthy last year, he didn't play. And it's looking this year like Kendall Hunter's going to be the primary backup, and they want to utilize Michael James as a kickoff return or punt return specialist. So it's like interesting. He was good when he was in the lineup last year. Like, he made an impact as a running back. And so it's so interesting to see his role diminish this year. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. Does Michael James have a similar skill set to like the Sproles and the Reggie Bush, where he should kind of? Be I don't. I don't. I don't think so, because to me, he's not this. Know. To me, he's not this this great pass catcher. To me, well, Michael James is like a perfect read option running back. He's exceptionally quick at hitting the outside or getting into the middle of a hole. He's diminutive, but he doesn't seem afraid to run on the inside. So. He's a really interesting read auction running back because he can be used in so many different ways and off screen action, that kind of stuff. But I liked Kendall Hunter, Kendall Hunter before he went down too, so I'm curious to see how that plays out as well. Right. All right. Um, well, uh, so cool. in the NFC, well, you, unless you have anything, last things to say about the Niners, uh, I, I wanted to – Pick your brains about who do you think will come out of the NFC, or do you think it will be determined by who wins between the Seahawks and the Niners? I think I think it's going to be one of those two teams makes the Super Bowl, the Niners or the Seahawks this year. I mean, Green Bay obviously has that chance, but I think it's going to be one of those two. In the playoffs, defenses rule. Yeah, I, I, I've shared a lot of concerns about the Niners, but I still like them better than the Hawks, and I'm a homer. Yeah. So if I was completely neutral, I don't know what I'd say, but I still like them better than both the Hawks and the Packers, which are the other obvious choices. It always is scarring for me for the Giants, though, because the Giants, even though we went to the Super Bowl last year, they walked into our home stadium in our prime yes. and just crushed us. <laughs> well, that was that was the other point I meant to make. That, that was a terrible They just pounded us with the running back. Yeah, and they beat us 24 to 6 in a game where we were at home and like there was no reason for that to happen. So the Giants terrify me when they're clicking. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but I I like the Niners more than I like the Seahawks, and I like them more than I like the Packers. But we get to see Week One. We get to measure the Niners versus the Packers Week One, so that'll be fun. Yep. Yeah. All right, well... Um, I won't be watching live because my wife surprised me with a, a honeymoon or an anniversary trip to Palm Springs. So not knowing that it's the first day of football on a very important day. That, that answers my question about what I'm doing on Sunday. I just I already told Dan to come watch at my house, and now I, I'm going to be in Palm Springs. Uh, in, enjoying my fabulous marriage, which is more important to me than football, but it's sad a little bit that I can't watch it. So does that mean we get to uh, text and tweet you with spoilers? Yes, I deserve it. Yes, <laughs> I totally deserve it. 
All right. Uh, before I let you guys go, uh, why don't you guys make your our ridiculously inaccurate Super Bowl um, picks? I think you guys already alluded it to it, but um, Ed, go ahead. Niners or the Bengals? Niners versus the Bengals. So we're like going back to like eighty what eighty seven? Exactly. Wow, we're like totally bringing the eighties back. Fantastic. <laughs> Rick, uh, who do you think? Niners over Patriots. That's boring, but <laughs> I, just, I like them better than the, the Broncos and all the other teams. I just that's boring, but that's my pick. Huh. All right. Uh, yeah. I probably should have thought of this before I asked you guys. Um, <laughs> See, right, you so, you work for Football Outsiders. You shouldn't be completely wrong here. Well, you shouldn't make just a horrific pick. We'll see. Um, all right. Well, based on and this is all I did put. I did put Vegas bets based on what the outsiders had to project. Um, I will say the Patriots versus. Ugh, I'll say page again because they have they're so bullish on them. I'll say the Panthers just for like the hell of yeah, it. Yeah. See, that's a brave choice though. I couldn't make. I couldn't bring my Browns to the Super Bowl. <laughs> I couldn't I love do Ed's that. expression right there. That's brave. <laughs> I, I thought my Bengals pick was brave. I'm not. That that was not as brave as the Carolinas. The Panthers. So you do think you're watching the Super Bowl and Ron Rivera's on the sideline? That's, <laughs> that's happening in your multiverse. He's wandering around making like decisions. Well, that's the only thing that bothers me about that pick is the Ron Rivera like wandering around being like. How did you get to the Super Bowl, Ron Rivera? I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't live in that world. I, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I, it could be Ron Rivera just gets fired, and they replace him with you know a random coach who's actually smarter. Who do you say wins that game? I cannot. Patriots or, or Carolina win the game? Uh, I'd probably go with Bill Belichick because I'm never betting against Bill Belichick and Brady like when it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, that's probably smart. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally could not, you know, I, I, I find no fault in anyone thinking the, the Seahawks and the Niners, um, or the Packers. I feel like the NFC is just a lot more competitive and interesting than the AFC. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the AFC and wanting to pick sleeper teams, but it's hard to talk yourself out of the Patriots and the Broncos. Because their yeah, divisions is. are just set up for them to win, and once they win, those teams just are better set up to beat you at home. I just don't... It's, it's, hard it's just to so interesting because the NFC was the, the worst division. I mean, it's so funny. When the Niners were good back in the 80s, the, AFC, the NFC was so much better than the AFC. And then the last 10, 15 years, it's been the AFC was so much better than the NFC, and now the Niners are becoming good again. It's the dynamic shifting again. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, everything just waxes and wanes. It's, it's, it's just not... We're not the rogue NFC team. It's like all the NFC team is, is yeah, is waxing. Right. <laughs> it's waxing. Not waning, but waxing. Waxing. <laughs> That's right, right? Waxing. Yes. Uh, sure. I should know if I'm a astronomer. W- waning is uh, who knows. Yeah. I, uh, balls. Someone's going to yell at me for that. <laughs> um. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to appreciate Ed and Rick for coming on to the PTMG podcast to talk about their thoughts on the upcoming season. Mostly um, proved correct. Hundred <laughs> percent accurate predictions. I wish you and if you have me on to talk about board games, I can talk just as long. Like you'll have a long, a long no. podcast. Yeah, like, the worst part is, I have no way out. Like at the end of the season, there's no part of me that can be like, yeah, the, I knew the Cincinnati was gonna blow. Like <laughs> I can't, I can't do that now. There's, there's, there's recorded proof. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, best of luck, I guess, to your Niners, partly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'd say best luck to your Raiders, but, but we're we are men of action. We, we are yeah. going for five wins <laughs> or something. I don't. No, you know, that or, uh, no we're, we're it's clowny or bust. I guess would be would be the best way of doing it. Yes, you know we're we're going to suck, and uh, it probably would be painful for me to watch. But <laughs> yeah, but um, it's football. Don't you, you start zero and zero, man. Everybody yeah, has their opinion, right but now. crazy things have happened. You start zero and zero. It's not like basketball. You know, Terrell not- Pryor could be like the man. I mean, he's not, but let's just say, <laughs> let's just say, he could be just like the greatest. You have no idea. All right, I, or, I, or you do actually. 
All right. You heard it here first, everyone. Terrell Pryor is the best thing that's ever happened to football. No, I said that in quotations as false Ben Lee. I didn't say Terrell Pryor was. Uh, you, uh, you got to stop. All right. I'm going to cut this out before you guys troll me to <laughs> death here. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the Robinsons for showing up. And, um, you know, tune in next week. We'll talk about something completely unfootball related, probably. <laughs> oh, crap, I said football instead of NFL. Dirt. Ah. Fail. There goes my, uh, my principles. Or crap. <laughs> uh, and once again, uh, you know, thank you, Ed and Rick. And see you guys next week. Thank, thank you, Ben. Later um, on. Mia sex time. <laughs> <laughs>